Um, but for this month, there's the share up. Everyone see that all right? Yep. Perfect. So like Matt was talking about, you have both Nate and myself here today to talk about our Pathway for Wildlife Habitat program. And our Pathway for Wildlife program is broken into three separate areas. So Nate will be discussing one of those and I will be discussing this portion, the community habitat. And so we're very excited to get to partner with the Nebraska Master Naturalists and conduct some research over these sites and their success, as well as look into growing opportunities between the partnership and the communities that these habitat zones are in. So I have my contact information listed here on the slide. I will also have it on our end slide. And then it's in the PDF that Matt has, and I will be sure to post it in the chat after my short presentation here. So the Pathway for Wildlife program um, is all about, as you guessed, enhancing wildlife habitat here in the state of Nebraska. And so it provides cost incentive programs for both landowners um, and community projects um, where Pheasants Forever will help pay for establishing seed through these programs um, to increase habitat for songbirds, pollinators, upland birds on some of our larger projects and other wildlife that was around. So um, if you were here discussing a little bit earlier, Mike was discussing some of the small mammals that he's worked with on our uh, precision egg projects. Um, and so small mammals are also benefiting from these projects, including our community habitat. These projects also have secondary goals of increasing soil quality and erosion management, as well as increasing water quality because we'll have um, more of the native vegetation helping clean out um, the, the things of runwater, uh, rainwater and um, runoff in these community habitat areas. Um, this portion of the Pathway for Wildlife Project is really focused on that community centric, those urban settings that we need more green space. And so that's specifically for this project. This photo that I have here is one located um, just outside in Lancaster County is one of those established ones. And believe it or not, that is actually on the backside of a school. You wouldn't even imagine if you're, um, from this picture here, but all of our pathway um, locations, including our community ones, have these signs so people can recognize our partners that we have established them with as well as recognize um, the goals. So you'll see the little um, statement there talking about the diverse planning that's located there. We will be using this program to uh, study the data, collect data and study the impacts of our pathway projects, um, both on wildlife and specifically for the community portion on some of the human audiences that are visiting them in the urban setting. So that's a little bit of the background. If you'd like more, feel free to contact myself or read that PDF that Matt was talking about. It goes a little more in depth. So here I have a map of the different um, community habitat projects that we have established as of right now. So we have two sites that are currently under processing right now. Um, they should have been seeded, but they probably haven't started very well on their growth just yet. And then we have our programs that have been seeded in the fall and should have nice growth development on them as of right now. Those are the pink stars located on the map. And then we have our community habitat programs that the planting has have been completed and they are established, but we'd like to see what's going on in them. What is the wildlife doing? Are pollinators starting to visit now that it's June and we're starting to have more of our um, flowering plants in bloom? We really wanna try and capture that research of how these plots are doing in these urban settings. Um, so I can send this map out if you're interested in work to get you with the nearest site. If you'd like to travel a long distance, we can work with you there. Um, but a majority of the people who have already signed up for the program, we have them commuting within their own counties. The types of studies that we're looking for on these locations are entomology studies. So walking a transect path um, throughout the community plot um, and studying the insects that are in the location. We also have an avian portion with a bird transect, vegetative study, um, and then we also have what's unique to this particular one, the education and outreach. So we'd like to do a measure on the number of people visiting the sites and what, day, what days and or 
um, times of the days that they're visiting with the potential of conducting studies. So being a master naturalist and leading your own study for the community to participate in. Um, so we're not quite ready for that portion because we need to understand what we already have before we start using that to utilize the sites, but that's what we'd like to see in the next few years. What we're looking for from you as a Nebraska Master Naturalist is the ability to commute, um, to commit 30 minutes minimum on one of these studies here. If you'd like to do all three or all four, kudos to you. You have fantastic amount of time to, to participate, but at the, at the minimum, we'd like to see at least 30 minutes, not including traveling time to the site. Um, we'd also like you to have some type of photo taking device, whether it be your phone or a camera to take with you into the field and the ability to identify the species of concern that you're completing this study on um, with or without a field guide. Uh, we're hoping that you take photos and then go home and utilize those field guides to complete a more accurate um, identification if you need a little extra help, but pretty simplistic on um, what we're looking for for this study. Methodology, um, again, I have forms that go a lot more into depth with this. I'm just going to briefly touch on it. You're going to travel with the location with a transect pre-planned. Um, I can help build that transect, or if you'd like to be involved with that process, you can. Um, you'll begin your 30 minute time requirement, start walking the transect, taking photos of those target studies um, and record observations on a field identification form. Some of you might have read in the form that we were going to use a phone app. Unfortunately, we're having some difficulties um, as it's brand new. And unfortunately, we're not going to be able to use this. So we'll have to go old school and record it on a field form that I've designed. Um, you can use non-photographed observations. If you can auto-identify or if you can identify it accurately, you can just record it on the notes there. But we also want to try and use as much photo observations as we can. Um, you'll complete the 30 minute minimum. Option one, you can return home and, to complete the form and identifications or two, if you want to do more than 30 minutes, you're more than welcome to do that and complete a more thorough study, but that is not required at all to go more than the 30 minutes. Um, last bit is to complete any miss, missing information on that field identification form. And you can submit that form and photos into our Dropbox that I've created. Um, or you can fill it in the data. If you don't have time to do that, I will be watching for those forms to come in and entering the data in myself. Otherwise, that's just a quick um, little blurb on our pathway for wildlife community habitat portion. If you're interested in learning more, Matt has that PDF. You can contact myself um, and I can help you understand the program more or we can get you started on that research I can get you access to those Dropbox materials and I get a uh, signed location ready. Um, otherwise, Matt, are you okay with opening it up for questions for this portion or do you want to do it all at yeah. the end? Uh, we can, I had, uh, there is one question Mike put in the chat. Um, so what's the frequency of the 30 minutes? Is it by monthly, once a month? So we're looking to have one completed by the end of the month. We are kind of running out for the time of June. For the rest of the time, we're looking for two visits a month um, through October. So not a huge requirement, but does include some, some time involvement there. But yes, we're looking to have potentially two visits to the field at least a week apart um, through July through October for this time commitment. Okay. Um, if anybody else has any questions, they could, for this segment, they could either throw it in the chat or unmute themselves. I, I've got a question, Matt. Mm -hmm. Holly, um, who, who makes the contact for the landowner or how are the sites, potential sites selected? So these sites have been pre-registered through our Pheasants Forever program. I okay. have contact with the sites along with the biologist that's managing the site, um, but these are community-based centers. So unlike uh, Nathan's project where we have to let the landowner know ahead of time, these are community centers that have public access at all times. Okay. Uh, Holly, can you hear me? This is Mary Johnson. Yes, go ahead, Mary. Okay, I emailed you, uh, 
a week or so ago and said I was interested in in doing Odo County. Yes. Okay, so do you have me signed up for that then? Yes, and I will be okay. reaching out. Um, thank you for bringing that up, Mary. Those of you who have signed up with me already and have confirmed that you do want to do the sites, I will be sending out the maps. Um, we'll see about today, but definitely by Friday, I will have the maps and the addresses to you um, by the end of the week. And you were going to draw a transept for me? Yes, okay. I am working on that <laughs> okay, thank you. right now. All right, great. Yep. Well, oh. there's uh, no questions right now. We can pass it over to Nate. Okay, here we go. So, um, like uh, Matt and Holly said, my name is Nathan Fluger, and I'm the Precision Ag Coordinator for Pheasants Forever here in Nebraska. And uh, I do work out of the same Pathways for Wildlife program as Holly does, but I am more focused on row crop producers. Um, and more specifically, I focus on a nine county region, which is heavily dominated by row crop agriculture. So I'll give just a little background on that here. So my focus area, like I said, includes nine counties, Merrick, Polk, Butler, Hamilton, York, Seward, Clay, Fillmore, and Saline counties. Um, and the reason I'm focused here is because of the heavy corn and soybean production. Um, and that just has to do with the productive soils and good rain, rainfall that, that these counties receive. Um, and because the, these counties are good for row crop agriculture, that leads to really high land prices. So a lot of um, conservation through CRP and, and programs like that really, really aren't that prominent on the landscape um, because producers would rather farm that that ground. Um, and as you can see uh, on the map on the left side, there is a lot of cropland throughout the, the nine county coverage area. There's a little bit of rangeland um, and riparian areas along with urbanization, but definitely dominated by row crop agriculture. So since CRP is not really um, a highly used management option, we've had to think outside of the box to how can we work with row crop producers and we have decided to utilize cover crops. Um, and the nice thing about cover crops is they're on an annual basis. So these contracts aren't long-term and cover crops has been a buzzword for row crop producers for a long time now. So there's a considerable amount of research and it's still continuing to evolve and come out that cover crops benefit erosion control through keeping the ground covered, um, compaction management. So. Uh, there's a variety of different species that can break up hard pans in the soil. Soil nutrient management, so your legume cover crops, um, you can suck up excess nutrients, stop them from leaching out of the system or running off. Um, but what brings producers to the table are those three left columns. So that's, that's what they're thinking when they think cover crops. But in our minds, we're thinking more biodiversity and wildlife habitat, which you can see uh, under the, the other column on the far right. So we bring producers to the table um, for them to think about erosion control, compaction management, soil nutrients, and then we're able to work with them and squeeze that biodiversity and wildlife habitat benefit in there as well. So Holly already did a really good job covering the Pathways for Wildlife program. So more specifically, my goal is to work within a row crop dominated landscape and make a difference for wildlife by diversifying the landscape. So we like to work with producers who are nervous about cover crop seed cost, um, operators who are wanting to try new things, uh, the odd, small odd areas in and around crop fields that um, may drown out or they may not make sense to farm just because equipment, um, things of that nature. Obviously, like I said, erosion control, soil health. Uh, we, always, we also work with producers who have livestock and are looking for added forage because um, that's another way that we're able to diversify the landscape away from just corn and soybeans. Uh, and then um, producers who are interested about interested in wildlife. And um, a lot of you might be thinking, well, no duh, you'd be interested in working with producers who are interested in wildlife. Uh, but a lot of the producers that I work with um, haven't, they're interested in wildlife, but CRP just really hasn't been an 
um, viably economic, economically viable for their operation, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, if we can utilize cover crops to benefit their bottom line and their operation and still produce that wildlife benefit, they're more interested in that. So what contracts are we targeting? So specifically for the master naturalist volunteer um, portion, we're targeting our full season cover crops. So these producers must have row crop land within two miles of a wildlife management area, um, a, any major CRP field or WRP, uh, which is a wetland um, type scenario. But es essentially we wanna be within two miles of good perennial habitat, which is already gonna harbor wildlife. Um, the cover crop must be planted prior to June 1st and must remain standing until March 15th of the following spring. So. We have eight contracts that were planted prior to June 1st, and that biomass will remain standing, will grow through the summer, stand through the fall, through the winter, and then after March 15th, these producers will be able to um, destroy that cover crop however they want, no-till into it, graze it potentially, um, things of that nature. So they must fall within that two-mile buffer. They must also agree to a diverse cover crop mixture, which we have three set mixtures. Um, and then if all these parameters are met and we come to an agreement that producer is eligible for a foregone income payment um, and 100% cost share on that seed up to 40 acres. Um, the reason that the, the foregone income payment is so high is because we are actually taking row crop acres out of production. So in order to get producers to take this seriously and utilize this practice, there had to be a, a pretty substantial foregone income payment. Um, and over here on the left, this, um, this could very well be what some of the sites look like. So there are sunflowers in there. When I said diverse mixture, it's upwards of 10 species in there. Um, a lot of flowering species, legumes, brassicas, you know, warm season grasses like forage sorghums and things of that nature. So these, um, if they get enough growth, which they should since they're full season, these can actually be some really neat looking uh, plots. So Holly did a really good job putting together a map for me. Um, and like I said, my coverage area is the nine counties that you can see here. Um, and, and similar to the pathway or the, uh, the um, urban, the urban side of things, the community pathways one, we're looking for uh, people to survey for pollinators and insects, uh, birding surveys, and then we also have some camera trapping um, opportunities available as well. Um, and <clears throat> is, since we're working on private lands with row crop producers, this is going to be handled on more of a first come first serve basis, just because we don't want to overrun um, producers with volunteers out there in their fields, because I will be in communication with the volunteer as well as the landowner um, and making sure everything is okay with being out there. Um, because we need to make sure that they haven't been spraying or anything, and we need to make sure uh, that they won't be out and about with equipment. So we just want to make sure everybody's safe. So um, there'll be communication uh, both ways there. So um, what are we interested in? We are interested in species richness of our cover crop sites. So if you're interested, uh, reach out to me and we will work together to select a site that works for you um, as long as somebody hasn't um, locked that one down already. Um, like I said before, just make sure we communicate about those survey dates. Um, and this is, this is really a trial, trial run for us this year. So what we're looking for is just the volunteer to go out there and record species uh, that they observed, get pictures if possible. Those are always awesome. Um, and then if you're doing an insect survey or a pollinator survey, I'd also like you to take pictures of those flowering species um, that are flowering at the time of your survey. So then I can identify um, what, what nectar resources are out there. Um, and it can just be a simple list. There's nothing too strict here um, for, for you to submit the data to me. Um, and pictures as well. Um, and then similar to Holly's, I would like a 30 minute survey minimum as well. If you're interested in making that survey a lot longer, that's fine. Um, I don't have a minimum number of times to get out into the field, but these plots will be standing um, all the way through the fall and through the winter. So um, getting out there multiple times would be really beneficial just because you're going to be able to identify different species at different times of the year. 
um, which, which would be exciting. Um, for the trail camera study, this one will be a little more of a, a time commitment um, compared to the others. So again, we'll work to select the site um, that works for you. Uh, we will deploy cameras, one on the exterior and one on the interior, if they are not already deployed. Um, and the reason that this is more of a time commitment is because we need to make sure we're keeping the vegetation cleared um, from, a certain, from a certain distance in front of that camera, just to ensure we're not getting repeated pictures of blowing vegetation. So through the growing season, this, this will be pretty rigorous. Um, you might have to go out there once a week in the beginning, um, and then after you're you're uh, getting that vegetation cleared and removed from the soil and you're not getting that growth, then you can start lengthening your visit out every other week, especially if that camera chip isn't uh, reaching maximum capacity. So I, right there, I just have check cameras every other week. Um, if vegetation is under control, you can, you can um, expand that a little further. Um, and then you will, the pictures will, or the cameras will be supplied and so will the SD cards. So essentially you would just go to your site, switch out the pictures, and then we would probably end up using WeTransfer just to transfer all those images to me. And then once we know for sure that all those images are transferred, um, you're able to go through and look at the pictures and you can delete out the ones that, that you think um, aren't of use, but we wanna make sure that we do have all those pictures before any of them are deleted. And here's just, so last year we did just like a trial run um, and we did get some pretty neat pictures. So, and some things that we don't wanna see out there either like this cat, so. Um, but the goal for this is to hopefully get some pictures of some pheasants and quail on our trail cameras. So, but all wildlife are welcome, obviously. Um, and I know I kept it pretty broad, but if you're interested, reach out and then we can discuss more location um, specifics for you. Um, and time commitments and things like that. So I know um, my contact information has been passed around before, but there again is my email um, and phone number, email, call at any time. And if I don't uh, answer, I'll get back with you as soon as I can. Thanks for the opportunity to present. Okay, what do we got for questions? Nathan? Yes, ma'am. Oh, hi. I just have a curiosity question. On the, the cost sharing and the $400 payment, is that all coming from Pheasants Forever? Or where does that come from? Yep, so the, the program is a partnership program between the, the Nebraska Game and Parks, Pheasants Forever, uh, the NRCS, and then the Nebraska Environmental Trust. Um, it is actually a grant funded project. So that's where the funding comes okay. from. So what do you think your total cost might be? Any idea? Total cost per site? Well, I mean, of the whole project that you're doing, how did you figure out how much money to request? So um, that the requesting of the money um, was above my pay grade and was actually done before <laughs> okay. I got hired. So the state coordinator um, went through and decided all that. And since it is a three pronged program with the community habitat, the grasslands component and my component, uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure how they decided on on how much to ask for. So I apologize. No, no I that's OK. Answer. I was just curious. I have a question to well, both Holly and maybe Nate. Um, you may have answered it when you said it was a NAT grant, but how long do you envision this program will last? Is it a one year or two year or uh, just do you have you game planned that yet? Either one of the programs, the pathway or the uh, cover crop. Yeah, good question. So for, for I, I know for mine and I imagine it's the whole pathways program in general. I know I have funding in through 2023. Okay. I'm not sure if, if that is correct for the other two, Holly. Um, but we've also started submitting grants um, for more in line with what I'm doing for the uh, precision ag component. 
Okay. Um, so we're looking for more funding to extend it multiple years. And, and also we're at, we're also looking for other partners with whether that be um, larger corporations, things of that nature, who are also interested in, in a wildlife benefit in row crop uh, systems. Cause we know that, that that payment through pheasants forever isn't sustainable. Um, yeah. it, and so that is a really new practice. And to my knowledge, really nobody else is, is putting these full season cover crops on the landscape to benefit wildlife. So this is more of, of an opportunity for us to learn and see what's possible um, when working with row crop producers. Then if I can hog more question time, uh, Holly on the uh, pathway to wildlife, that program, is that primarily, uh, you know, you, you said community based, so like public parks, or I mean, I guess that's redundant, but parks or, um, locations like that? Yes, so um, I'll add on to what Nate answered. So we have funding for the next three years for our pathway program. Okay. NET, um, and you, you can go on our social media and read our article, our press release on what NET granted us for this year, but they fund a multitude of our projects. Um, pathway is just one of six they funded this year oh, okay. um and so they they love that we're working with landowners and that we're working with communities to establish that habitat and so um they do enjoy what we're putting forward and it's a great partnership between the two of us to answer the community habitat portion so you can schools pick up the community habitat project a lot public libraries we have a few utility companies that have a little extra small property um, that they want to put green zones in. And so they, they work with us on that. Um, library schools, uh, community centers, like you mentioned, Mike, public parks are picking it up. Um, and so we, we have a, a daycare that's applied. We have two middle schools that currently have it in. And so it's, it's really wherever there are um, community-based programs where the community is going to be visiting it and, and learning about um, the zones that we're putting in there for little green space zones with native plants. Um, we have a lot of flexibility with this program on, on putting it in. Yeah, uh, you, may, we, you may or may not be aware, but the uh, master naturalists are working with, uh, well, we're, we have what we call the master naturalist junior program, mm -hmm. which will, um, and I'm not the expert on it. I'm not, <laughs> long way from being a junior anything <laughs> but anyway um you know it's going to be a a, a school-based program and is and i'm just throwing this out is there a way or sh should there be a way i guess that's the way to put it that we can marry the junior program with your uh, community program and you know it, it would seem like that would be a good fit because then the, the master naturalist juniors would have a location uh, if they so wanted, you know, at their school or, or whatever. Absolutely. So there's great potential. And Matt and I were discussing some of this early on. So um, I helped with sharing your, your junior when you were looking at hiring them. I shared that out because that's a great opportunity there. Um, but yes, definitely we could partner in that aspect. Um, because like I mentioned earlier, we really want to extend the education and outreach portion in the future. Right now, we're just trying to understand, are people visiting these sites? Are they utilizing them um, as was intentioned? And so in the future, having that junior master naturalist or master naturalist um, do a small prairie walk, as most of these sites are uh, an acre in size, um, it'd be a great site to, to partner up and host programs as that's where we have the habitat actually at. Yeah, is there a size limitation restriction or? It has some flexibility. The community habitat is requested to be an acre um, okay. in size. We do have a few that we ended up combining into three or five acres, uh, but we generally try and keep it within that acre size just because many of these uh, community-based projects don't have that big of a space. To right, be right. It's generally yeah, I, an acre in size. Is the yeah, I, size. Frequent, I frequent a community center in Douglas County 
uh, and they've got you know a big sign and you know this is a habitat restoration project and it's you know it's basically a stormwater collection point which is fine uh, but if you know but it's certainly not an acre uh, so that's probably too small then for for what you guys are looking for I'll I'll be in touch with you Mike I'll send you what we like the um the contract restrictions and things like that so that you can take a look at we okay. are flexible with things especially okay. with this community okay. function though so if somebody's yeah. interested if they can't fit in community we might be able to put them in a youth pollinator project as well so i'll be yeah. in touch with you mike okay. on, on a little more details there yeah and maybe you could forward that to, to the people that are doing the master naturalist junior too so you know they'll be in tune with that um the set the follow-up question and the apologize for hogging all the questions now, uh, but can, well, let's say uh, there, we have a master naturalist someplace. I'll just say Tilden, Nebraska, because that's where I was born. Uh, but let's say they're, they're there and there's no project, but they'd like to do something. Can it be work such that, okay, we got a volunteer that's interested, but we don't have a site that they go find a site or somebody finds a site in an area that that would work? Nate, I'll have you jump in. With, with your cover crop, that'd be a lot harder just because your area yeah, is so yeah, specified. Yeah, I, um, but Mike, I'm pretty knowledgeable with the Cowboy Trail. And I know we have a lot of monarch plots along that. Um, yeah. And I know I'm currently working on one um, with my family to put one in at Ewing. Um, okay. And so, there is potential that if, like I just discussed with you, um, if there is a community center that wants to get the program in, we could work on establishing a habitat location where we may not be able to do a study this year, but we could get it established and we could have one set up for next year. Okay. So that is definitely something we could have um, the master naturalist participate in. And, and well, I wonder if that's something that we should make known to the master naturalist that I mean, if it's if it's doable, and there's not a site there, and you want to you want to participate in this program, that maybe a connection can be made. You know, you know, it's kind of what's the chicken or the egg? What's first, the volunteer or the site? And you know, if we can keep rotating it and make it work, then you know, maybe we can bring those people in that feel isolated. You know, they're they're not around other master naturalists or or whatever, and this might give them an opportunity to to do something and you know get them to do you know be a volunteer in what they want to do. And Very much just, so. As just a sidebar, I lived in Ewing too, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and so I have had one. Um, I have six signed up currently for the community habitat. So that's been a fantastic turnout from Nebraska Master Us so far. Um, I did have one that was in a location where it was too far to travel, um, but he's already discussing with some of his people in his community on getting something Good. established. So, okay. Yep. So I'm I'm kind of acting as the, the buffer, the gatekeeper essentially. So if we have somebody who's interested, I'll help them through that process. I'll add one more question and I'll show okay. you. Promise. Um, I don't know when the program's next board meeting is, but I wonder if you know we should somehow bring this up to the full program board mm -hmm. so they're aware of what could or may potentially be out there and and see what thoughts or ideas they mm -hmm. would have collectively. Yeah. And, I can talk to Andrea about it as well, but if, if you can spearhead that, I think that'd be okay. great. Okay, I'm shutting up now. No, that's fine. I was just going to ask if uh, either of these programs, are they specific to Nebraska or are there other state PF programs that have similar type of um, studies that they're doing? So the pathways for wildlife that we're working out of is specific mm -hmm. to Nebraska, um, but there very well could be other programs in okay. other states that go by a different name. Um, and probably to, to best figure that out would just be to reach out to their state coordinator, yeah. I would imagine. Yeah, this is a question that I had curiosity because I don't know how much Feathers Forever works on a state 
level with other states or if there's like a national type program protocol that they do or it's just individual to each state but well if we do we have any other questions this afternoon if not i appreciate everybody's time um mike's got one more <laughs> Uh, I, another general question for PF. Um, of course, we just talked about the smaller communities and stuff. Is there any philosophical or operational issues for an urban site? I mean, if, for example, inner city, Omaha, inner city, Lincoln, want, had the space for a community type place, you know, that would that work? So you're talking larger than an acre? Well, an acre, you know, uh, well, I, for example, I've, I've done some small mammal work at one of the high schools in Lincoln and their campus is huge. So they've got acres and acres. Uh, so that, you know, that seems if it could be done, well, let's just ask that question. Can PF or would PF be interested in, and it's, it's an urban site. I mean, it's not next to cornfields or a small town or anything like that. So that's one question. And the follow-up would also be, um, what about an inner city site where, you know, there isn't prairie or, you know, at least not in the last 200 years. And, and they want, you know, they would like something or it may be a master naturalist junior thing. So um, I guess I'm not asking for an answer there, but I can see some potential there uh, to foster both of those programs in locations that could really use, you know, something like this. Now and I really will shut up. <laughs> to answer your question, Mike, yes. So PF was already doing that in some instances. What the process to going about that is if you have somebody who's interested and they have an, an area selected, then you'll reach out to one of our Farm Bill wildlife biologists and we will see which program would be most beneficial for it. Um, so we have chapters already um, where we have chapter representatives that have reached out to schools or have knocked off a portion of their acreage just because they want pollinator specific habitat out there. Um, and so they work with a school to plant it and create an educational component within the school or a Boy Scout group. We have several Boy Scouts that are putting in projects like this right now. So um, yes, we are interested in projects like that if we wanna do a little larger scale. We just have to figure out which program would be most beneficial and provide um, the best cost incentive or uh, programs like that, whether it be chapter spurred where a chapter's sponsoring it, or if, um, if we put you through a program or if PF just purchases everything. So if you have a site like that, reach out to myself or one of our Farm Bill wildlife biologists and we'll be happy to work with you on building a, a process of getting that started. So we are certainly interested in that. Anything to put habitat on the ground and get community involved with it. Okay, thank you. And correct me if I'm wrong, Holly, but those community projects, they're looking at like the maximum size as an acre. So that's more to target smaller areas, right? Yes, and that's why a pathway for community habitat would probably not be the best for what Mike's talking about, the larger size, but we can, we have other like pathways for grasslands, that's a, a component or specific pollinator um, seeding that we can work with on the chapters and do a youth pollinator funded project where we have Bayer as some of the sponsors there and funding available there. So we have other programs that are available to accomplish the same goal. Yeah, okay. Well, the message I'm getting is if, if, if the Master Naturalist Junior Program would need you know, a site to do something, regardless of where it's at, uh, we should chat with you folks just to see if it may fit into one of your slots and then, you know, proceed accordingly. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. That, that's a good message. Holly, do you want to, um, you mentioned the state uh, has forever uh, habitat meeting is coming up soon. Do you guys want to offer us a little bit of information about that real quick? Yes, no, so up. we are hosting our 30th annual state habitat meeting um, coming up on July 26th, so not this Saturday, but next Saturday. 
Um, and it is a great way to learn about everything that we're doing PF and with our partners wise. Uh, Matt and I were discussing getting a table set up for the Nebraska Master Naturalists, um, but it's going to be a fun hands-on day open to all ages. So we'll be having dog training, gun fit, archery. We have a big section on pollinators. We have Nate and various other farm bill biologists will be doing habitat demonstrations. So we've already pre-prepped and built the sites and you can come and see what our programs look like after they've developed and grown. And definitely stop by if you have the chance. I'll post the link here in chat if you're interested to look at our uh, agenda. There is, um, there is a cost to it. However, uh, Nebraska Master Naturalist would fall under the resource professional um, discount and could register there at site. We have Skeeter Barns, which is a great barbecue joint. We'll be catering the meal, but tons of um, great opportunities to learn about what's going on in the state habitat and conservation wise. And we'd, we'd love to have you there and you can meet our biologists or all of our biologists are going to be present and you can continue asking questions about the programs we have available. Well, great, Holly, thanks for that plug. She just uh, put the link to that in the chat. Um, but with that, I wanna thank everybody for their time this afternoon. And if you have any other questions about this, you know where to find us. So uh, thanks Holly and Nate for speaking to us and um, we'll get this posted up and shared with more master naturalists and hopefully give them um, your way. But I uh, hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.